This is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to Dare to Dream. Today's show is going to be pretty cool because Matt LaCroix is here, and he's an ancient civilizations expert, author, and researcher at Gaia. From the secrets of the past to the nature of reality and the ancient gods of history, Matt is an endless pursuit of the truth. This is the Dare to Dream podcast, recently won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show, listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, also nominated for People's Choice Award and a Webby Award. Thank you so much for all your support. And by the way, subscribe, like, I read all of your comments. I'm a media visibility expert out in the world, and what that means specifically is I am a book writing coach. I help you write a highly engaging page turner book. I also have a company that takes authors' books to a guaranteed international bestseller status. And the final leg of my visibility work is that I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. So if you would like to do this, become more visible, get more exposure for your message, your business, your being, I have a gift for you, and it's templates and videos to teach you how. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And I thank the sponsors of the show, Dr. Dean here and Access Consciousness for their energy work out in the world. You can become a facilitator or take their classes anywhere. Go to Dr. Dean here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm speaking today with Matt LaCroix, an ancient civilizations expert, author, and researcher at Gaia, who's appeared on shows such as Ancient Civilizations, Open Minds, and Beyond Belief. He's a frequent guest on numerous podcasts, radio shows, and panel discussions, and has just written, co-written, his third major book with Billy Carson entitled The Epic of Humanity, which will focus on uncovering the mysteries of human origin story, the timeline of lost civilizations, and ancient catastrophes. He also has an amazing YouTube channel you want to check out. And if you want to connect more with Matt, go to thestageoftime.com. And soon he will be featured at the Conscious Life Expo. And if you want to see him, after today and seeing the show, I will also have a link so you can register in the show notes. And with that, I welcome Matt to the Dare to Dream show. Hey, it's so good to have you here. Hey, it's great to be here, Debbie. I'm looking forward to having a good conversation tonight. Yeah. So before we started, I was asking you a little bit about what is it like to work in Gaia? So, you know, for people out there, and I know a lot of people who subscribe to Gaia and watch it. I know it's turned my life around, around certain subjects I became fascinated with, and it really opened the doors for me. So for that, I'm very grateful. What is it like for you working there? I do feel very lucky. Um, I am someone who did a lot of this as a hobby, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of other researchers who get along, follow along this path. They want to do it full time, but, you know, that's not always a realistic thing, or at least it takes time to get there. And for me, I was juggling a full-time job as doing like environmental science work, but I also was doing all the writing and the podcasts and all the shows. And it was honestly, it was a lot to juggle. And I really, honestly, I put, I put it out into the universe. I'm like, I want, I want to do something that I'm, I want to do this as something full-time that I can commit all my energy to. And I was someone who really loved um, Gaia, especially ancient civilizations, the show. And it was, I did project the idea in, out into the universe and I, and I fully encourage people that concept of how we manifest our own reality and how you can put your positive intentions forward into something you truly want. And I was able to, that sort of worked out, I guess you could say, um, in my favor. And I get to do some really cool stuff there, writing, writing and researching top shows as well as being in them. Um, as a talent. So it's a really amazing dream come true to be able to do what you love. So I feel really honored to be part of that. And, that, and of course, you mentioned that led to things like you and going to Conscious Life Expo and, and a lot of other really incredible things. Yeah, sorry, we have some dogs that just went nuts. Clearly, it's mailman time. So forgive me for that. They will die. They'll quiet down or they're very excited that you're here on the show. 
Um, and it's interesting what you just said, Matt, because after college, I know you began studying ancient civilizations, philosophy, quantum mechanics, fascinating, and history. And then that evolves into your focus today. And here you are uncovering these disappeared esoteric teachings from secret societies, from ancient cultures. So I'm curious what ancient texts, what lost civilizations, what evidence have you discovered along the way that absolutely changed the trajectory of your life? Well, you know, I want to just bring up this concept right now that's that a lot of people are sharing and you're, you're seeing a lot on the social media. Um, I want to just give an example of this. Um, Graham Hancock just did, has his new show came out on Netflix, um, Ancient Apocalypse, and he's getting attacked by mainstream media from across the entire spectrum because of this concept that putting forth the idea that there have been lost civilizations, not primitive civilizations, but civilizations that were highly sophisticated in many ways and once existed in our past were wiped out and disappeared. And then we basically had to reset and start over again. Now that concept, and I guess you could call that theory, is not accepted at all by the mainstream. And that whole concept of our history um, if you were to look back, if, like if you were to look back at what our history states in books, um, history books, you go to school, you learn a certain doctrine, this narrative of history where, well, look, human civilizations were pretty primitive, you know, hunter gatherers, and they sort of gather together, and then they rose up to eventually have uh, the ancient Sumerians in Mesopotamia, and then the, then the Egyptians, and then, you know, later on through um, the Persians and Greeks, right? This is this narrative that we're taught, and we're, there's this very tight window of saying that, look, civilizations emerging, uh, developing agriculture and metallurgy and animal husbandry, this only started 6,000 years ago and started in ancient Sumer, in, in, uh, in which today Iraq. Now, that entire story <clears throat> is essentially right and wrong. There was a chapter of human civilizations that reemerged during that time. Then that's something that is absolutely true. But there's also been other chapters that have happened before that, other chapters that existed in our story that have been lost. And we truly forgot about them almost entirely to the fact that now, <clears throat> like for instance, a concept like Atlantis is like considered a myth. And I find it to be remarkable that something like that is considered a myth. When someone actually goes to study where that story came from, they find out that it actually had nothing to do with Plato creating um, like an analogy or some kind of a story to, to, to discuss like a perfect civilization versus a non-perfect civilization. He got all that information from ancient Egypt. And in ancient Egypt, they recorded that lost story of the past. And so the more we look into taking down, um, I guess, the, the control of our, of almost like of our mindsets to be able to be open-minded, to accept the idea that there's so much more to our story, then we're able to then take these pieces of evidence all around the world. It's becoming almost insurmountable. This, the amount of stuff that, that has now come out, if you were to try to look for evidence of this, this, these lost civilizations or lost civilization, depending on if you wanted to look at the fact that they were closely connected in many ways, is that our story is clearly far more complicated than we're taught. Now, I take this to another level than people like Graham Hancock and others really, really discuss the idea that there was like a cosmic impact that occurred around 12,000, 13,000 years ago that was the cause of wiping those civilizations out. Now, I have an alternative theory um, that I take down a different path, but based essentially to answer your, your, your question, it was something that I just fell backwards into without, without expecting to this research just sort of came into my life. And it was, I've always been incredibly inquisitive about, um, you know, when I was a kid, look, seeing, 
seeing movies and other depictions of like ancient civilizations like lost in the jungle that are mm -hmm. you know a civilization was once there and then all that's left is like the remnants of that that concept was just embedded in me and then along the way when I when I became familiar with um, with work work like Robert Temple and Graham Hancock and others, it truly put me on this path of wanting to research and discuss this and write about it. And so here we are today. It's become truly like the, the greatest passion of my life. So interesting because you say, and and I know you're being politically correct by saying the theory, but you know when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, Matt, it's really myth, isn't it? It's myth that's been ingrained in so many people that they believe this is where we came from, this is what the earth looked like, and so forth, when in fact, all of that's blown apart. First of all, when it comes to Lemuria, when it comes to Atlantis, people remember past lives. Many of us are back again because we really screwed up, right? And we promised we're going to get it right this time. So there's that. And then there's the inception of the planet where humanity came from. And we had one myth we were taught when in fact, many of us today who are open, who are metaphysical, are just the downloads are tremendous. The information is clear. We are not from this planet, right? We're an amalgam of part human, but also part Pleiadian, Arcturian, et cetera, reptilian. Like we're a lot of different things really in our DNA, some of it junk DNA. So many of us know this truth and we don't even adhere to that myth. And when I hear you say this, that's what I'm thinking is that it's the same. We were taught very specifically about civilizations when in fact you and others have uncovered truth really about the inception of civilizations. And so I wanna ask you because if these highly advanced civilizations you're talking about were destroyed by global catastrophes and they included these megalith structures and pyramids that defy even the capabilities today and then they mysteriously disappear right at the height of their sophistication what about these outstanding earth catastrophes what about the lost civilizations is there any one in particular you can talk about well that's it, yeah there's so many er areas we could go with that with that question because when we think about you brought up lemuria mu right this this civilization that has evidence of existing in the Pacific, whereas its counterpart Atlantis existed in the Atlantic. But that was just part of the story. It, it goes so much greater than that because it incorporates civilization, civilizations like those in, in Mexico and South America, those in Egypt, um, those in Southeast Asia, right around the Mediterranean, even into ancient Mesopotamia. It seems that we're finding evidence that all these civilizations were connected in different ways. Just like today, where we have a world that's connected through influences of other places and the technology sort of spreads around the world, that same type of concept seemed to have existed back way back in, in antiquity with these civilizations. And you brought up star sy system constellations and other potential beings in the universe. We seem to be something far greater than we're told. And I think that's the, really the biggest reason why this entire narrative seems to be guarded is because when you look into those civilizations, you find out, look, they weren't materialistic. They weren't focusing on, on money and on going shopping they were putting all of their energy into creating these massive megalithic temples and these pyramid structures that were aligned perfectly with star constellations when the energies of the earth and they seem to understand this lost concept that we don't have much of an understanding of anymore and that is that we are highly conscious energetic beings of the universe that are incredibly powerful that have the ability to manifest reality and create all of these incredible things but these gifts that we have have largely been lost within us. They're sort of like an echo, we're like an echo of our former self. And those civilizations have the evidence of their understanding of that woven into all of their structures. So the more we look at them and the more we're, ever to, we're, we're able to differentiate between those ancient lost civilizations and then the civilizations that came later, that's the hardest thing that I think people need to wrap their heads around because you know, not everybody has studied geology for 30 years. Not everybody has studied climatology. But when you actually look at 
these structures, you'll see fine precision work, these giant perfectly created blocks, megalithic blocks, often on the lowermost levels. And then something above it is much, much more primitive. And what we're seeing is that Look, there have been civilizations that have come and gone and other civilizations came to these sacred places that they built and they built right on top of them. So it becomes very convenient if you were to want to hide this kind of a message or bury it in a narrative, you would say, look, the civilization that built on top, they're the ones who built the rest of it too. And I always, I give this example every time, but it's just, to me, it's, it's a really good example is if I walk down the street and I go to um, like a statue or some stone library or whatever, and I, I spray paint or write my name in the wall. <clears throat> and then they were able to like come back for some reason, some reason something happened and they found that and they found my name. Does that mean I built it? Does that mean that I was the one who, who was responsible for creating it? And I think that's what we, we need to focus on here is that our history is incredibly complex. And just because a civilization has evidence of being more primitive later on there doesn't mean that we completely ignore the older concepts of what was there originally. So like, and I'm going to give you an example. There's a place called Baalbek, Lebanon, that is um, at just, just east of the Mediterranean, um, sort of near Israel. And the country of Lebanon is right sort of smack in between ancient Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean. And in, this, in that site, we have some of the largest blocks in the world that we have no idea how the civilization moved them into, into place. But the problem is that thousands of years after they disappeared, the Roman Empire conquered that region, and then they built right on top of it. And so we're told that the Romans built it. And that's the, the issue is that not only do they not have the technical sophistication to be able to move those, but they would not have had the understanding or the, even the reasoning to why to create those. In fact, we don't even fully know what some of the purposes of these structures are that are left over, but clearly there's this entire chapter that includes Atlantis and ancient Lemuria Mu that has been wiped out and so such an enormous amount of time has gone by I think it's a it's a quote from um, I think Gandalf says it like in Lord of the Rings, right? Isn't it like an ancient? I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this, but it's like an ancient story that's so old that eventually becomes uh, a myth and then a legend, and then it just and people don't believe it any longer because so much time goes by that it, it, they consider it to be not real anymore. That's why we need to look at a lot of the ancient myths, the ancient Egyptian, Greek myths, ancient Sumerian myths. And then put them alongside some of these ancient tablets that are left over, ancient writings and ancient stories that tell us something that we're not listening to. We're not listening to the fact that there has been an incredible chapter of our history that has been almost entirely wiped out. And there's only these fragmented pieces left behind. So we're like almost like putting together a puzzle with just like a few pieces with a lot of things missing. And we're trying to, we're going to, trying to see what it should look like but we only, we don't have all the pieces. We just have like bits and pieces of it to put back together. Has anybody ever gone out to the site in Lebanon with really sophisticated equipment and done tests to find out the nature of what things are made of, or if there's any activity going on that can't be maybe seen or heard with the human body? One of the issues here that we're really dealing with is that there's a very controlled system of information within mainstream archaeology. Right. Mainstream archaeology has essentially prevented a lot of these places from being fully investigated the way they should. Hmm. And I am someone who champions certain sites around the world that have been deliberately abandoned and ignored for various reasons related to what I'm saying to you right now. One of them that's a great example is the city of Eridu. It's in ancient Mesopotamia. That's a that's a city that, according to the tablets, was the first city ever created, mm. ever in the world. And yet that site has only been a tiny bit excavated in the main part of the city. And the, in the part of the temple where most of the ancient records are from that are, is discussed in all kinds of tablets is basically completely ignored. And, and I've done the research into that to see that, look, the University of Oxford and Iraqi Museum, they investigated that and did some digging around up until 1946, 1948, and they literally abandoned the site. 
and they have not been back since, and it's being looted and destroyed. And this is the same narrative we're finding in a lot of places around the world where a place like Gobekli Tepe in, in Turkey, that is like this huge astronomical temple mapping the heavens has only been 5% excavated. And yet it's been radiocarbon dated to be 12, almost 12,000 years old. So essentially it's already doubled the age of any civilization that was supposed to have the capabilities to create those things. Now, I want to mention or answer one of the things that you, you brought up about is about the types of, of stones they were using. What was their purpose behind them? What's amazing is that we're finding that most of these giant megaliths are created with granite. Now, granite is one of the hardest materials that we have on the planet. For people who maybe aren't familiar with things like the Mohs hardness scale, if we have a civilization that supposedly is created that in our history books, and they were using things like Bronze Age tools, which is what we're told was the most sophisticated that those civilizations could have gotten. The problem is the Mohs hardness scale argues that, look, granite is harder than, than if you had bronze. You can't manipulate something harder than the tools you're working with. So we're seeing perfectly round drill holes. We're seeing saw marks all throughout places like in Egypt and drill holes all throughout South America and Turkey. We're seeing this precision cutting in places like Pumabunku and Tiwanaku in Bolivia in South America that defines all logic made out of something called andesite that's even harder than granite. We mm. have no idea how those civilizations created that. We don't even fully know why they created that, but the, the consensus that a lot of researchers like myself, myself are really honing in on is the idea that these civilizations seem to be using high quartz, high quartz silica rock for some kind of an ener energetic purpose yeah. to create these giant structures for either higher consciousness, maybe to create some kind of a portal or something for reaching higher states of consciousness and energy, but maybe even some kind of a, a, a mechanism for like a doorway, because we find near these sites, these giant false doorways that mm. seem to go nowhere. They're just carved out of the rock. So our mm. concept and, and idea that, you know, there may be civilizations that came from somewhere else in the universe yeah. that maybe incorporating concepts that are different than some might think, you know, let's, let's think more of using technologies with like a gateway, in my opinion, than maybe like a ship, maybe perhaps some, some kind of a mechanism for traveling between different worlds. And that's, that's it's becoming more and more of a possibility, the more we look around the world. Yeah. And what's beautiful, you know, when you talk about granite, granite is a great healing stone and granite specifically grounds. So if, you know, people have problems and they feel ungrounded or not quite in their bodies, or maybe there's a lot going on, there's a lack of focus, you can literally hold or work with granite and it will give you immediate presence. So yeah. it's very interesting. I mean, I was getting downloads while you were talking, absolutely, that there were energetics going on in these sites. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. I appreciate the examples you gave. You also, I know in your research in these lost civilizations that there's all this history left behind, right? There's ancient writings and they speak of these devastating floods and earth changes that occur on a cyclical basis. So what about that evidence? Is there evidence that actually shows what caused these cyclical events? So <clears throat> that's the one thing that's echoed anywhere we have ancient writings or even indigenous stories that have been carried down mm -hmm. from, from older civilizations into some groups like in the, in the Amazon and South America and Mexico and other places is they discuss a much older time period when their ancestors were highly sophisticated that where they had existed in different pockets around the world simultaneously, like we find today with more primitive civilizations. Now, the, the ironic thing is that the civilizations that were more primitive living off the land um, were the ones that actually were able to survive, which makes sense because they were able to get through really difficult time periods when uh, others could not. And I think that that's something we should remember today is that <clears throat> with all of our sophistication and technology, if, if one of these events were to occur, you know, would we make it? And I think that's the, the most important message to come across. But so what we find is that these civilizations um, that had existed at that time period, they left behind ancient records in some cases. 
some places they those records were lost. But in places like ancient Sumer, what I'm finding when I actually study that, it's one of the areas that I've spent most of my time studying is the ancient Mesopotamian area, uh, connecting over to you places ask like- it, You actually speak Sumerian or can you read it? I'm, I'm learning how to read Sumerian, but it's certainly taking a long time. It's an extremely complicated language. It's a language that's been, um, that has died out and nobody knew how to speak or write it up until um, around 1875 when George Smith cracked the code. But prior to him, the Sumerian had been a dead language for well over a thousand years. So we're talking about a language that is a language isolate that doesn't share any other language components. And this was a language that was left behind from a civilization that seemed to have, and this is the, the critical thing, different epics that have occurred, okay? So the, the area around, like I mentioned, Eridu in ancient Mesopotamia, I have gone through the records that actually speak of this, that talk about how there have been at least three different epics when those civilizations in that region have risen up, fallen, risen, and fallen. And we know that because they left behind the only form of writing that can actually survive enormous amounts of time. People think paper is a, is this highly sophisticated thing, um, let alone digital stuff that just disappears right away. But paper can only last 500 to 1,000 years in perfect conditions. So the only way that we understand it currently, uh, and I have another theory on how there could be another form of writing that we haven't fully understood yet, but the, 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 the oldest form of writing that we can actually read and understand now is the ancient Sumerian cuneiform. Now, cuneiform is a type of wedged in writing that is either in clay or stone, which means that it's, it's, it's written into the stone and clay so that when, even if the surface sort of weathers, because it's, it's, it's wedged into these, um, the stone or clay, it can survive for an enormous amount of time. How and deep, when you say it's wedged into the stone, how deep are we talking? It's wedged in, you know, a, a, a centimeter or so, but it's, it's far enough in where you could have a significant amount of weathering that could allow it to survive. But regardless of that, be, besides the fact that it's wedged in, it's on either fired um, clay, right, um, to, to hardened clay or even stone in some cases, which is lasts tremendously long compared to paper. So some of the stories that were that have been carried down that we can mainstream archaeologists have tailored uh, or considered a myth, they're something that's carried down from multiple civilizations who have written down these stories that have carried down from the Sumerians, all the different versions of them, to the Akkadians and the Babylonians. And they have taken what is earlier stories and then recorded them and protected them in these ancient libraries that are so old, like the Ashurbanipal library or the, the newer library that was discovered in Eblis, Syria, in that civilization. These ancient libraries are so old that they are basically the remnants of civilizations that went out and found the tablets that had already been ancient, accumulated in them in libraries, and then those civilizations disappeared as well. So it's, it's something that's being carried down from truly ancient times. And they speak of how there have been these series of catastrophes that have occurred and that civilization had to be re-lowered, they say, from heaven. Kingship re-lowered in heaven with cities that had to be recreated again after these, they call it the great deluge, which it's not just from a potentially like a tsunami flood, but there's other things that may have come along with that. <clears throat> but the flood is how they usually describe it because every one of these events seems to have ended in massive tsunamis. And I think that's where this, I think this inherent memory that exists within us for these catastrophes seem to occur. And it's strange, the more that I like research and read about this, the more that you almost feel like you have these like glimpses of like something seems like, when you're reading these, like there's a, there's this element of truth. That's like within us. You're like, that makes sense. I don't know why I know that or why that seems like something that is almost like I'm remembering because these things have happened so much that they're embedded deep within us. And I think that what's fascinating that people need to understand is that they describe how each time the civilization had to be restarted, but what at some point after several restarts occurred, 
<clears throat> the influences behind helping those restarts disappeared. And we became, we went back to having to almost become primitive again. So imagine civilizations rise up to this highly sophisticated level and then they fall and they try to rise up again and they try to rebuild and another catastrophe occurs. And then every time they fall, more and more is lost till eventually they become primitive. And now these ancient tablets, um, there's thousands of them that I, I study. Um, I use, but I, what I essentially do is I have a lot of people ask me, well, how do you know what they're translating is accurate? We have some of the best experts in the world that have looked at this, like George Smith, in my opinion, is the greatest pioneer in this, who have had, who, who over the years have had other experts come in and do their own translations that verify with his. So I'll compare multiple different versions of, of a translation and find the common message and then say, look, you know, these are the best experts. Let's take these translations and let's find out the ones that are the most credible. And then let's cross-reference all these stories and then try to like recreate this, our story based on everything we can. And that's one of the things that I, I pride myself on. The new book I just, we just released with Billy Carson, The Epic of Humanity, has the most amount of ancient translations embedded in it from Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian to ancient Egyptian and ancient Greek and other stories. When we're talking about this story, our story, our, our epic, I always include the most important pieces of these texts so that people can go and read it for themselves rather than just having someone say something. It's another thing if you're able to go in and read it for yourself and like, wow, that's, that's like a phenomenal way that they were so smart in how they wrote and how everything had like symbolic meaning and how they, the same information that's maybe in one tablet is present in like another tablet from later civilizations, but the same type of information correlates. So we need to start paying attention to this because these stories, they're all that we have left and they're part of us. And they're telling us, look, you, we have an incredible story that is so much more sophisticated that leads us to an understanding that tells us who we really are tells us how sophisticated we once were and how connected we were to the stars in the universe. And we've forgotten that. And we're trying to get our, we're trying to find our way back to that. And that's some, something that I'm trying to help recreate. Wow. I have goosebumps while you're talking. It's incredible listening to all this. So many questions. First of all, where is Sanskrit in all of this timeline wise? Sanskrit is an, also an ancient writing that came out of the, the Hindu region of India, which mm -hmm. All we have to do is if you go look at India, like um, Kanhari Caves or Alora Caves or <clears throat> all these ancient temples, Bara Bara Hill, we have a different kind of construction, but similarities in how highly sophisticated these temples are in, in that region telling us, look, those stories that they're telling us in, in ancient Sanskrit writings, they're from the same time period. So what we're seeing is, that part of the world is part of what I call the lost civilizations right. that once existed around the world. Those have similarities with a lot of Southeast Asia. And what I believe is that that region was the influences that are left behind of the, the Luria Mu civilization, because they had a very different style of building. They had a very different style altogether. And the way that they describe the ancient stories, they talk about the same things that, that are echoed all throughout ancient Mesopotamia with these like almost like sky gods, these mm -hmm. advanced beings that seem to be very similar to us in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. which is what the whole purpose of this understanding is that we essentially are them. And I think that's where the message should get across is that mm -hmm. there have been influences that have come here that have given rise to humanity from a sort of a, a primitive mammal blueprint that seems to have existed where if we look at genetics, um, there's a brilliant geneticist who's no longer around anymore named Loya Pai, who said, look, if we look at 200,000 years ago, there seemed to be this point in time where our brains doubled in size out of nowhere. And we developed all these different sophistications, this chakra center within us and all these things that wasn't there before. And we became something different. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden we became like this higher dim dimensional sentient being that we existed here and we used to live a long time and all all these different things and we've forgotten that over time mm 
And I think that's one of the saddest things is looking at how people view reality and what they, what they spend their time doing now. It's very sad because all the ancient texts and all the ancient writings and everything left behind says, look, you're an incredible, incredible being of the universe. You know, this is what you should be doing. And then you look at what we are doing and you, you begin to wonder if, you know, part of the purpose of hiding all of that is that we don't realize who we are, because I think then we'll realize how powerful we are. I've heard and this before. I know everything, right. It'll yes. change everyone's perspective of reality here. So, so many people ask, well, what's the purpose of hiding all of this? What's the purpose of blah, blah, blah. I don't believe in conspiracies or all these things is we need to say, look, we are so much more incredible than we've been told. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why in school, we're told that consciousness is, is derived from the brain, which is not true at all, is that we are our consciousness. It's more like we're in like an avatar body experiencing a physical reality, but we're really non-physical beings that are incredibly powerful. And we're here to experience this world that we're existing in. But we have had a lot of very clever mechanisms that have kept us almost entrapped in this illusion of reality. The Nag Hammadi talks about that. The Nag Hammadi um, is an ancient Gnostic writing that came out of Egypt. And that was found in a cave along the Nile River during World War II because they had to hide it because these ancient writings around the world were being sought for destruction by the Roman Empire and other various empires who have wanted to wipe out this story so that it's, it's not known so they can rewrite the story. And so what we're dealing with is a very complex history of us trying to piece together the remnants of these incredible civilizations around us and how they were once connected to the stars in the universe and how we can find our way home. Mm, I love that. I love that. And is there a reason for the pattern? Why floods? Why tsunamis? Why is that a way that would wipe out a culture? Do you have a sense from your research that actually these beings had a way, maybe using the portals to exit the planet before right. something catastrophic happened? Or did they remain and be taken away with the civilization? Yeah, that's an area that's fascinating. Um, there's a tablet called that, that a lot of people are very familiar with, but few have ever actually read it, called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, in that is an area that I've never heard anyone talk about, and I don't know why. But in, that, in those tablets, because these are long tablets, so if you don't know where to look, it's difficult to figure out what to pay attention to. Mm. And things like that I'm about what I'm about to say are things that I like to inject and put into like the epic of humanity so that people have like these these pieces that I consider the most important parts of all these texts. Anyway, in that Gilgamesh is a king of the city of Uruk, which is funny because Uruk was a real city that existed. And yet we're told that he was just a mythical king that wasn't real. And yet the city that he's mentioned, we've already found the city and we, it's, it exists in Iraq today. So it states that he went on this journey to find immortality. And in that story, it says that he met with an ancient king who is no longer alive in the physical world anymore. But this ancient king turns out to be this figure known as Untanapishtim, who is this last king of these ancient cities that was destroyed before the catastrophes, okay? And he says, look, Gilgamesh, where I come from, long ago is an ancient city so old to you that it's almost been lost to your memory as well. And this is something that the time period of Gilgamesh existing was lost also. So this is like, we're going back multiple chapters, but he states something fascinating in there. He states that he talks about how the gods here, not the forces of nature, but something more powerful than that. It's these influences here, they said the gods once walked among you in that among us in that city when it existed and he says that when the deluge occurred they were so appalled by allowing that to happen that they departed and left and they never and they says that it, it states that they basically disappeared from here now what's interesting about that is there's other tablets like the atrahasis at well as well that discuss how there's this council of 12 of these powerful beings that seem to decide the fates of humanity. And they describe how there's a cycle that occurs with these catastrophes that they can essentially either create or allow to happen. Now, why would they want to do that? Well, they discuss in it how 
humanity has had different time periods where they've risen up to become so powerful that they were like immortal and that all these different things and that they were essentially wiped out for a reason to start over again like it's a game like some kind of a cosmic game to see oh you know, if, if you're wiped out if can you rise back up again and how far can you go in like a certain time period it's it seems to be a this almost like beyond our comprehension game that's being played in the cosmos where these these cyclical events seem to be something that happens to almost reset and then civilizations come rise up again and then it seems to be like a game to them and they write about how they observe humanity and they watch as these events occur and they decide the fates of those who are here now they describe it like for instance when plato um, found out the story of um, atlantis it came from Solon, who was another Greek philosopher that was much a Greek philosopher and poet that was much older than Plato, who had traveled to Egypt and had found out the story from the temple priests of a temple called Sais. And they said, look, Solon, you Greeks remember one catastrophe, but there have been many that have come before you. And what we, what we find is you start putting this together and someone like me, I'm a, I'm someone who start, studies climatology and ice core samples. Mm. We're looking at ice core samples from Greenland and Antarctica. And we're saying, we're looking back and we're saying, look at this, this time period of 12 and a half thousand years ago, there was catastrophes in these, in these ice core samples that lines up precisely with the dating that's coming out of places like Gobekli Tepe. Mm. Now Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, was radiocarbon dated to be from that same time period, but was deliberately buried to almost to protect it as that civilization fled to try to survive the events that came, came over that area. It was never dug up again, meaning that the civilizations that created that celestial library, they were tracking the heavens to track time. Yeah. That civilization went to try to survive the catastrophes, probably underground in places like Darren Kuyu in Turkey, these underground cities, but they never survived. We know that because they never dug it back up again, which means that these civilizations in many cases tried to make it through, but they didn't. And what it's telling us is, look, these catastrophes are nothing like we've experienced in modern human history. Nothing. They're not even on the same level. And what we're finding is that on megaliths around the world, <clears throat> in Peru and in Egypt, all throughout these areas, we're finding these burn marks in these melting of the rock. There's a famous set of gigantic statues, the largest in the world called the Colossi of Memnon in Egypt, outside Theban Egypt. And that area has all this damage on these giant structures where they're cracked and broken in half. And on the Colossi of Memnon, <clears throat> what we have is on the same side on either statue is like this burning and melting on the Northeast side on both of them. And if we go around the world at the same time, we find out that a lot of these ancient structures that have been built to be aligned to magnetic North are off by 23 and a half degrees, okay? Almost everywhere in the world. All these ancient sites that are aligned to like magnetic north and all these things in the Colossi of Memnon, they all not only have damage on one side, on particular side, but they're all off, which those civilizations didn't make mistakes. They're mm -hmm. all off by north by 23 and a half degrees, meaning that this event that occurred was so significant, it altered the axis of the planet. Wow. Okay. Because okay? it means that they were, it was built when North was in a different place. Mm. Okay. But not only that is the damage on those structures is so severe that it had to have been caused by something that is almost like at, at a Hollywood, for instance, mm. these structures were made out of granite in order to melt granite in the way that we see some of these, the melting of vitrification, it's called, you would have to have temperatures in some parts of the planet that would have had to exceed 2000 degrees. Okay. What we're, what we're finding is that it's a multitude of different catastrophes that seem to have come through that was so incredible that it lasted for thousands of years off and on. Wow. Right. So if you were an incredible civilization, and even if you had the abilities to survive hundreds of years through these, mm -hmm. try to imagine the earth being in turmoil for up and down over the course of hundreds of years where another catastrophe would occur. 
for over 2000 years. Now, that would be enough to wipe them out, mm -hmm. <clears throat> allow their memory to almost be lost, and then another civilization to come through that had survived like an indigenous culture and <sighs> find the remnants of them left behind. And that's why all the structures around the world, especially in places like Machu Picchu and a lot of Egypt, is we find this really primitive building on top with these really uh, with mortar and these really rough stones, but all these incredible giant blocks in the bottom because they're from different civilizations. Yes, this now, is I so beautiful. Oh my gosh. So I, I'm getting excited because I literally wrote down here while you were speaking, energetically, I got indigenous. Ask him about indigenous and the shamans because my sense as you were speaking, honestly, just energetic, not intellectual, but the fact that these very advanced civilizations that they born, they gave birth to the indigenous who, of course, we've discarded disgustingly through most of humanity, but are actually the bearers of this intelligence, this knowledge and this advancement. Exactly. Is, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're the, all that was left behind, you know, some of these elders and these priests and these shamans from these cultures, they pass these stories down. They didn't have the means to be able to create what those civilizations before them did but they had the knowledge that was passing down. That's why stories that really got me into this, like the, the ancient Dogen out of Mali, Africa, their stories where they talk about these influences of the Nomo, which their descriptions of the Nomo are almost identical to in ancient Mesopotamia, the Nomo with um, the Apkalu and this these fish-like suit beings that they discuss at how, well, look, our story, the Dogen, discussing Sirius star system, with discovering like three stars in the Sirius constellation, two of which we've only just discovered the second one and they already knew about all these things. That story, though, was only able to be preserved because their elders decided to hide themselves away and not be polluted by any outside messages. And this is why they were able to, to bring back such an ancient story because it's very difficult to preserve ancient stories that don't get polluted or lost if something terrible happens to those people that know those stories. And that's why we need to start paying attention to what's left over in these ancient tablets and these stories left behind from the indigenous because they're the ones who know the true story and they know who we really are. Yes, totally, 100%, which is so beautiful, plant medicine making its uh, its rebirth, its renaissance on this planet. For the indigenous, you know, I think it's incredible that they would even say that Western man, woman are going to be the bearers of this going forward, which is like, that's incredible considering what we've done. So powerful, powerful. You must travel so much, Matt. Have you been many, many places on the planet? We are, um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of, a lot of ancient structures in, in temples in, in Mexico, and I've traveled a lot of other parts of the world. Uh, we actually just had a trip to Peru and Bolivia that was canceled for a couple unfortunate reasons, but it's going to be rescheduled for the summer. But I'm hoping to get to as many ancient sites as I can. And look, <clears throat> with the amount of technology we have today, even if you can't get to us ancient site, with the amount of incredible 360 degree pictures and all this satellite imagery and photography, you can still study these ancient sites even if you aren't there. But my goal is to get to as many as I can because the ancient world is a fascination for, for me. And I am a, a, I'm trying to be a self-taught archeologist. So I would love to be able to get out to every single site I can in the world in the future. That's beautiful. And then there's also the pioneer probes, right? They've made really incredible discoveries. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about the reasons behind um, some of these catastrophes. So as I, as I talked about earlier in the show, I am not someone who supports purely a cosmic impact theory for, to, to, to talk about or to describe the reasons for these cyclical catastrophes. Number one, I cite the idea that Look, we don't have any impact craters, impact craters around the world that are younger than 13,000 years old. So, and then some would say, okay, well, they could have hit the ice caps. Yes, that's entirely possible. But I like to um, mention the, uh, a, a great name, a geologist named Robert Schock, yes. who has looked- He's been into, on the show. Yeah, we love he's, him. He's brilliant. If when we look into this vitrification and burning on some of these structures, when we look into the uh, the the ancient plasma in the sky that some of these ancient ancient cultures were drawing when they saw some of these events. Well, I think we're looking at here, the more that I've studied it, is that we're looking at massive solar events. 
that if you had a solar event that occurred on the earth that was significant enough to basically disrupt what's called the magnetic sphere, magnetosphere. It's basically the, the magnet, magnetic poles balance and create the, what we know as the ozone layer around the world. It creates this electromagnetism that basically blocks these incoming solar rays and protects our planet. If you were to have massive charged particles from the sun hit bombard the earth enough and you caused a weakening of that field, those charged particles could pass through the earth in certain places. And would, which would cause a whole host of different problems, not only that extreme temperature gradients, but climate disruptions, you would have massive spikes in temperatures, melting ice caps, disrupting ocean currents, and creating, I mean, basically, once that axis tilt of the earth is, is, is wobbling and moving, every tectonic plate in the world would go off sending tsunamis. And it's like, it's like an end of the world scenario. But <clears throat> the, the more that I've studied, the more that I've taken it a step further. I don't believe that it's just random solar events. I believe it's part of a cyclical uh, cycle that's occurring with our sun with what I believe is a binary companion that has almost been lost to our knowledge. I know that might seem crazy to some people because, I mean, how could we not know if we have a binary star companion? But the, the fact is that we have compelling data that shows us that way beyond the inner solar system, beyond the sun, we have this outer area of <clears throat> asteroids and comets called the Kuiper Belt, which by the way, was only discovered in the 1990s. This, it's basically this area of massive area of asteroids and comets that surrounds the inner solar system. But beyond that area, is, there's other things out there, but we can't see them because they're not illuminated. And so it's very difficult for us to understand what's going on beyond that. Now, this is where the Pioneer probes come in. For those who don't know, Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to ever travel beyond Mars and Jupiter, okay? Everyone's heard of the Voyager probe. Why is nobody talking about the Pioneer probes, right? Pioneer probes predated the Voyager probes. This was where it all started. Now, the Pioneer 10 and 11 <clears throat> were sent out by NASA in 1971, 1972, because they were wondering why our entire solar system was tilted on its axis. Uranus and Neptune and even the inner, the inner planets were slightly tilted on their axis and they didn't know why. Furthermore, Caltech University began studying asteroids and comets in the Kuiper Belt and noticed this very strange perihelion um, look to them as they're, as they're traveling where something is perturbing our entire solar system, okay? Now, when Pioneer 10 finally went into the outer solar system in 1980, 1983, it discovered these objects out there because it had sensors on board to detect gravity and detect basically signatures from when, it, when some kind of a mass exists at, out in space. And they found, which NASA announced in, in the early 1990s that they had found a planet, a rogue, a, a very large rogue planet that existed beyond the Kuiper Belt that they had initially talked about, but very much covered up later, that they said was four to five times the size of Earth. So it's a very significant planet that was existing out there. But what happened after that was that as Pioneer 10 is traveling, it discovered something else. And for, for anyone who doesn't believe me what I'm saying right now, I highly encourage you to go on my website, thestageoftime.com, where I have a diagram that was made in, by the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia that actually talked about and discussed exactly what Pioneer 10 found. Are you suggesting that the sun has a binary, binary twin? It does. It does. Okay. And this is what Pioneer found. Now, after, after Pioneer 10 discovered this, this binary companion, I mean, so far out that it, it, we can't even see it because it's basically, they called it a dead star. Now, this is not my terminology. This was from the diagram for the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia. And it's the only place that I've ever seen, ever, where the findings of Pioneer 10 have ever been disclosed. It is one of the greatest conspiracies, if not the greatest conspiracy that I've ever seen in my life. Because what happened was that it discovered the cause for what I call the cyclical catastrophes of lost civilizations throughout history. 
I believe that this binary companion is the cause of why the sun goes through these periods of emitting em enormous amounts of, of charged particles, solar energy, which, is which happens on a cyclical basis and is also the reason why ice ages seem to occur around every 100,000 years on the planet. <clears throat> We're talking about a complex cycle that seems to occur with a binary companion that in 1983 was 50 billion miles away. So this is not something where it's this close relationship. Just imagine, imagine an ancient star companion that millions and millions of years ago exploded, okay? Mm -hmm. Exploded and became a dead star. And that's what the, the Pioneer 10 probe discovered because it can basically take signatures. So from you're saying that they discovered a, a dead sun. Yes. Binary twin. And that, so essentially you're saying at one point, that there were two suns yes. that were orbiting around a common center of mass, yes. right? Gravitationally, they're bound to each other. Yes. And at some point, there's even a catastrophe that took out that twin sun. And yeah, but needed it to be dead. Exactly. And the thing is, though, that it's their perihelion orbits, their mm. orbits are so enormous that we don't even fully know the amount of time it takes but I've been doing a lot of calculations and a lot of work to try to figure out the orbital track of this binary star. But essentially, I theorized that that explosion of that binary companion may have even been what wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Yeah. And it would have had to happen in a, thing, in, a, in a past called apahelion, meaning that it would have had to be the farthest away that it, that it, that it travels if it to explode, because if it had done it uh, closer to our solar system, it would have destroyed the entire solar system. So we're talking about ancient catastrophes that go back far, far farther than most people ever realize where this cycle has existed, which is why the earth goes through these cycles continuously. I've looked at Vostok Antarctica ice cores that go back 450,000 years and analyze them. And we're seeing a continuous evolution of ice ice ages that develop with ice caps in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere that that always mimic an exact melting around every hundred thousand years almost precisely mm -hmm. on a on a basis of almost every time and then the earth rapidly warms up goes through periods of stabilization before rapidly de um, getting colder again and going through these cycles showing us that this cycle this set of cycles on the earth has been happening now for at least half a million years so 85 percent of stars are binary not exactly. all are, right yep yeah and the changes you're talking about it's interesting because i've heard this in regards to climate change is there really a climate change are we going through these cycles that have been going on ad infinitum and so what you're referring to, is it actually affecting us today? Does it have something to do with the current changes related to this cycle? Yeah, I think that's the entire reason why the Pioneer uh, 10 data was scrubbed. And I mean scrubbed wow. everywhere. You can't, I encourage people to go look into what the Pioneer 10 probe found. And, and you're talking, people... you, to be specific, you, so you say NASA Caltech, you're saying JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory? is what. Um, well, that's the interesting thing is that Caltech, and I've reached out to some people at Caltech with no answer back, um, but they they have done independent studies on the Kuiper Belt to determine that, yes, there's a planet that exists beyond the Kuiper Belt that's influencing gravitationally. They've acknowledged that. They call it Planet Nine, and that's one of the areas that I'm doing research on. This planet is a planetary companion of the dead star, Okay. That's the, so they've acknowledged that there's a planetary companion. Think about it though. Why would you have a planet like that just roaming around with no reason at all, influencing periodically the Kuiper belt, unless it has a host that it's, that it's revolving around. There's a dance going on in our solar system that's an enormous dance between the, the, the binary star, this planet, that's, I believe, the cause of the precession of the equinox on Earth. And wow. why we seem to face different constellations every 2,100 years. They seem to all be related. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I've got a quote from one of your books about the uh, ancient texts. And the quote is, 
the only reason you're able to read these words now and not be at risk of torture or being burned at the stake is due to certain laws and freedoms that were finally enacted, which have temporarily allowed this control system to lose its grip here. That's why this particular time period is so important. So talk about that, about why the oldest texts became suppressed, why they became hidden from most of society. Even, you know, you're talking about things being scrubbed, which actually could have great influence and power in the knowledge. Yeah, it, essentially you can trace that back to the transition of the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire with Constantine. So Constantine, that occurred in a place called Constantinople, which is in um, modern day Turkey. And that transition went from Constantine and various other handlers and people that were involved in that realized that they could control the entire narrative. They could control the history of our past, as well as religion and understanding our spiritual connection, if they were to take over the entire message and essentially wiped out the ancient writings from the past. They were traveling around and destroying libraries and destroying groups around the world. They were protecting this ancient knowledge. That's why uh, the Nag Hammadi was hidden in a cave along the Nile River. Why we find the Dead Sea Scrolls in a cave along the Dead Sea. Th these things around the world were being deliberately hidden and to be protected in the future because they knew that they were being sought for destruction. There's an ancient story here that's been preserved for thousands and thousands of years by these groups that it's been under war. It's been under war by the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire, and then other groups that have come after into today. This ancient war is basically a war on information. It's basically like when the conquistadors like Cortez went over and uh, conquered Mexico with the Aztec and the, the, the ancient Maya, they burned 99% of every Mayan text, the only, the only Maya, like one of only two Mayan texts that survived the Popol Vuh was because one of these Spanish uh, priests, conquistadors, decided to protect it and keep it, keep it around for us today. But essentially, they were trying to wipe out our, our story of the past. And it's been going on now for thousands of years. And so whatever is left now, whatever is left is basically what we have left over. And I want to give an example. In the Royal Ashurbanipal Library that was found in ancient Nineveh in 1849 by Austin Henry Laird, they found um, upwards of 40, 50,000 cuneiform tablets. And out of that, we only have a few hundred that have been translated. Where are the rest of them? Why did so many of these ancient manuscripts and texts from the Aztec and the Maya end up in the Vatican archives in Rome? What we're seeing here is a controlled opposition of our history to hide this entire chapter of our past. It's far more organized and controlled than we realize it is. And that's why the people that are doing this, me and Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and Robert Schock and Robert Braval and Billy Carson and countless other names, none of us are archaeologists because we can't be. We have to be sort of on the outside to be able to do this. Because you would lose all credibility and all, um, all of your academic work that you have built up to that. We're, it's, it's a war over our past that we're fighting right now. And it's, it's growing to the, to, because of the internet and people getting more access to this. It's becoming more and more known. And this veil of a, this illusion, this illusion of our past and who we are and all this, it's coming down right now as more and more learn the truth. And it's becoming like a crusade for people like me. Mm. So tell us more about your book with Billy Carson. It just came out two days ago. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate humanity. That. Where that can we book, get it? What's in it? That book was um, over the uh, over course of two and a half years of work went into that book. <clears throat> And what we wanted to do is Billy Carson and I have been working together for a number of years. And we said, you know, hey, why don't we collaborate together and try to write this story that, you know, we call the epic of humanity? Because our story is an incredible epic. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And, if, and I think that there hasn't been a book yet that has come out that's told the chronological order of our story. 
from the beginning all the way up until now and where we're going in the future. And that's what this book, the whole purpose of it does. It has timelines in it with where everything places, where the ancient history, according to the best evidence we have and what the ancient texts tell us, as well as graphs and charts. And basically, Billy and I try to recreate to the best of our ability what our story is how far back this lowering of kingship came, this creation of humanity, these influences of these like sky gods and all of these things that have happened throughout our history. We're trying to tell what this, this epic is that we have. And that's why I'm very proud to include as many ancient texts that I believe of any book ever created where people can go in almost like a, it's, this is like a, a dictionary of our ancient texts of our history where you know, the, the, to me, the most important pieces of those ancient texts are preserved here, like a time capsule for the future so that people can go and read themselves what the ancient people try to tell us, but also have all the data and evidence to back up to, to like try to recreate this story of, of our epic. Beautiful. And I know you're going to be speaking at the Conscious Life Expo. I'll be there. I never miss it every year. I do. I cover it. And so it's in February. It's live or live stream. So there's no excuses for folks not to be able to see it. And there's going to be a link that you can get your tickets. You must get tickets and highly recommend it. It's my highlight of every year. And there'll be a link there so you folks can register and attend. Talk about when you're going to be presenting, sure. what you're going to be presenting. I'll be presenting on February 10th. So please um, sign up for that if you're interested. I've done some posts on it. She's going to have a link in there. Um, I only have like 150 people that can have it in the room. So it's going to fill up. So I hope you can sign up for it. But I'm going to have a whole presentation I'm going to be doing that's going to go into a lot of the things we talked about tonight and quite a bit more, where we're really going to be showing charts and data and breaking this down in a very complex way to try to recreate our ancient history and talk about ancient catastrophes. A lot of stuff um, with, with um, these lost civilizations and the dead star. And I wanna show data and really try to um, bring this lost knowledge back to the light with, to try to be as compelling as I can with um, something that's, a, that's, that's both academic, but as well as something that's um, entertaining and interesting. Oh, absolutely. So you're gonna be Friday night. Friday, yeah, Friday, right okay. before Jimmy Carson does the panel on, on ancient history stuff. Okay, fantastic. And I'm just so curious with the inception, where you started with all this, Matt, and all of this fascinating exploration, digging, unearthing, learning, what has it caused change for you in consciousness and spirituality in the life of the universe and your part in it. What has that research led you to as a being right now that has created a great trajectory and change? It was one of those incredible journeys where learning about all these ancient teachings, <clears throat> the spiritual nature of these civilizations, all the things they left behind these ancient texts, the way in which they worship the cosmos and consciousness, that journey for me has been something that's been embodied in me as well. Oh, you almost can't have that effect not affect you. It's so powerful. And you never look at reality the same way again. You are changed forever. It's something where it does become difficult to um, sort of have ca casual conversations with a lot of people. I think a lot of people listening to this will, will understand that once you go down this, they call it the rabbit hole, which is a term they use a lot. But once you go down that to understand a completely different history, you know, who we really are, once you, once you go down this, 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 this path, it changes everything in your reality in your life. And it, it becomes almost like you're existing on a different reality plane than the others. You exist in this place where um, in, in my, the illusion of us, I talked about how it was almost like this farm of conformity with people that don't realize they're in a farm. You all of a sudden find like a hole in the fence. And you, you know, you run off into this, into away from the farm and you sort of look back and you see a lot of these um, people sort of stuck in this conform mindset where they're all, you know, focused on certain things and their mindset is, is very much controlled. Um, you're looking back and you're saying, you know, Hey, you're like over here. And like, most of them can't hear you or they're like, 
what are you doing out there? You know, come back. And it's, it's difficult to be able to connect with people that are on that level that can understand, because this is definitely a process that is very um, unique to everyone. Everyone goes down this path in a different kind of way, but in, in, in this, the similarities are striking in terms of how someone changes once they start understanding the, their, the power of their energy and their consciousness and the, the being that they are in relation to the universe. It, it makes them into this alternate path where they can never see reality the same way again. And for all those people that, that feel lonely out there, you know, that we're so interconnected in the world, go out and find others like you, because eventually there is going to be a shift in consciousness and it's already happening where more and more are starting to wake up all the time. And it's an exciting time to be here. Mm, mm, mm. This is Dare to Dream. What are you next Dare to Dream, Matt? What are your future dreams or goals? Um, well, the Epic of Humanity just, just released with Billy Carson. I highly encourage people to check that out. That's um, a huge project. And then after that, I'll be tackling another enormous book. Um, this one is going to take me some a couple of years because I'm trying to take on telling the entire story of this dead star and its influence on lost civilizations. So I'm going to call, the new book is going to be called The Rise and Fall of Civilizations and the Dead Star. Beautiful. Well, you have to come back on when that book comes out, but maybe we won't wait that many years. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been really fascinating and full of goosebumps for me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Debbie. I really appreciate our conversation. And besides the stage of time.com, is that the best place for people to find you or any other place? The stage of time.com. I have a YouTube channel at Matthew LaCroix. You can check out, um, I'm on Instagram, um, uh, and I'm trying to do more and more all the time. So just, you know, come, come check out my work if you're interested. And I really appreciate all the support that people give me. Beautiful. And of course, again, Conscious Life Expo. You don't want to miss it. It will be in the show notes. Definitely register today. And I end today's show with this quote from Susanna Clark. Once men and women were able to turn themselves into eagles and fly immense distances. They communed with rivers and mountains and received wisdom from them. They felt the turning of the stars inside their own minds. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment, share, subscribe. I read them all and I appreciate y'all so much. And next week, I am featuring the amazing artist, medicine woman, and huge podcast host, Blue. Unbelievable conversation. You will want to tune into that. Thank you all for joining us today. And remember, you are far greater than you ever imagined, far more powerful. And read some of the books and follow Matthew LaCroix so you can find out more about the inceptions of where you really came from. <laughs>